Attempting to Optimize the Oral Microbiome, Part 3. In Part 2, the goal was to reduce salivary levels of Tanarella forsythia and Fusobacterium nucleatum. So the question is, why? So both of these bacteria can impact the health and or function of conditions not only in the mouth, but outside the mouth. And one of those is Alzheimer's disease. And as we can see with the list of bacteria that have been linked with Alzheimer's disease, both Tanarella forsythia and Fusobacterium nucleatum have been linked with Alzheimer's disease. Now also note that on this list is P. gingivalis, and that bacterium will make an appearance later in the video. So then the next question is how? How would I reduce levels of these bacteria? So I've been using a homemade mouthwash as a prebiotic for the oral microbiome. And as a quick side note, a prebiotic is a substance that stimulates the growth of already existing bacteria. And if you're interested in the contents of that mouthwash, I'll link to parts one and two of this video in the right corner. Now I've been using the mouthwash three to five times per day with the goal of optimizing my salivary microbiome. So for test number three, I added clove oil to the mouthwash, but I also used another oil, summer savory oil, which, which, is, which has been shown to impact levels of these bacteria too. And I'll link to that paper in the video's description below. So then there are several questions that arise. Did it work? What was the impact on the rest of the salivary microbiome? And then how will I further attempt uh, or how will I attempt to further improve the salivary, salivary microbiome? And as we'll see, there may be a role for berberine. And to quantify the salivary microbiome, I then used bristle. Now, if you're interested in measuring your own salivary microbiome with bristle, there, I have a discount link, and that link will be in the video's description. Now, on to the first question, which was, were levels of these two bacteria reduced? So that's what we can see here with levels of Tanarella forsythia and Fusobacterium nucleatum on the left. And then we've got the relative abundance. So the percentage of these bacteria and all of the microbes that were in my salivary microbiome, first for test number one, test number two, and then for test number three. So first we can see that there was no Tanarella forsythia detected in test number three, which is good news. But then Fusobacterium nucleatum got worse with values of 1%, 0.7% on test one and two, and then it increased to 2.2% of all of the microbes in my saliva for test number three. So from this, we can see that there are mixed results for these levels of these two bacteria. And is that the impact of clove oil being in the mouthwash, or is this just normal variation? So then that also raises the next question, should I keep or remove clove oil from the mouthwash? So for more perspective, let's take a look at the rest of the salivary microbiome and its composition. So first, were levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria increased? And the reason I say increased is because nitrate has been shown, at least in, in, in an in vitro study, to act as a potential prebiotic for the oral microbiome. And actually, in that study, it didn't just increase levels of nitrate-consuming bacteria, it reduced uh, levels of potentially pathogenic uh, salivary bacteria. So here we can see levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria in my sample, and they, uh, or in my samples, and they belong to two main bacterial genera, Neisseria and Rothia. So for test number one, without any nitrate in the, mouth, in the mouthwash, we can see that these nitrate-reducing bacteria were 53, about 53% of all of my bacteria in my salivary microbiome. And then for test number two, with the goal of increasing that, further increasing that above 53%, I added four grams per liter of potassium nitrate. But unexpectedly, we saw that my levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria went down to 46%. So then for test number three, I cut the nitrate co composition in half or the content in half to two grams per liter. And still, nonetheless, levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria actually went down further to 35.5% of all of the microbes in my, sal uh, in my saliva. So were levels of nitrate-reducing bacteria increased? They were not. And Note that the highest levels of these bacteria were present when there was no KNO3 or no potassium nitrate in my mouthwash. So with that in mind, for the next test, I'm going to remove potassium nitrate from the prebiotic mouthwash that, I'm using, that I've been using for a while. Now, why would, why would increasing the nitrate content of the, uh, the mouthwash not increase nitrate-reducing bacteria? So I'm already on a high nitrate diet, and if you missed those videos, I'll link to them in the right corner. So levels of my oral nitrate reducing bacteria may already be saturated such that if I add more to a prebiotic mouthwash uh, where I don't rinse after you know uh, brushing my teeth and then gargling and spitting but not rinsing it out, 
uh, they may already be saturated such that I can't increase them further. And maybe even if I do try to increase them further with more nitrate in the mouthwash, as shown in my data, maybe I'll actually increase them by some, or decrease them, sorry, by some unknown mechanism. So then what was the impact of clove oil on the rest of the salivary microbiome? And there are several questions inherent in that question. First, were levels of oral health related bacteria increased? And these are mostly the non nitrate reducing bacteria. But then also were levels of tooth decay, halitosis, and gum inflammation related bacteria reduced. So first were levels of oral health related, related bacteria increased. And that's what we can see here. This is Bristol's definition of quote unquote beneficial bacteria. And this is mostly from non nitrate reducing bacteria with the exception of Neisseria mucosa, so the second species on this list. So for the, for the first two tests, I was at about 21% of all of my microbes in my saliva were from these seven bacterial species from these seven uh, beneficial bacteria. And then for test number three, it was still in that ballpark, 19.8% of all the microbes in my saliva. So now we can answer that question with a note. So they were definitely not increased with the addition of clove oil in the mouthwash. Now, as a quick note, I have room for improvement with these four streptococcus species, uh, and we'll see more on that a bit later. So from these two bits of data, from the nitrate reducers and the beneficial bacteria, we can see that the addition of potassium nitrate for the two tests and or clove oil for test number three to the prebiotic mouthwash did not increase, in my case, nitrate reducing or levels of other oral health related bacteria. All right, so what about these reds, the tooth decay, halitosis, you know, uh, which means bad breath, or gum and or gum inflammation related bacteria? How were they impacted by the presence of clove oil? So first, looking at levels of tooth decay related bacteria, and I don't want to spend too much time because I want to get into the berberine story. I think that's the most interesting part of this of today's video. So in terms of tooth decay related bacteria, for the first two tests, I had relatively low levels of these three bacteria that have been linked with tooth decay, 0.3%, zero. And then for test number three, it went back up to 0.3%, but that's still relatively low, which is, which is good news. All right, what about levels of bad breath related bacteria or halitosis? And there are a lot of bacteria that have been linked with halitosis as shown here on this list. Now for the first two tests, I had in the five to 6% range, but then we can see for test number three that it got even worse. It went up to 9.4%. So then now we've got a, uh, that they, the levels of halitosis related bacteria didn't get better, they got worse. So which bacteria are the most significant contributors? Because I have no interest in having any bad, bad breath related bacteria in my saliva. So uh, in order to get rid of them, first I need to know which ones are the uh, most significant contributors to the total. So it's definitely not Tanarella forsythia, at least for this test, as, as we can see with the green arrow, they were reduced to zero and whether zero percent. And whether that's because of clove oil or natural variation, uh, we don't know. But the majority is coming from two Fusobacterium species, not just Fusobacterium nucleatum, but a second Fusobacterium periodont periodonticum. I, sorry, that's a hard one to say. Periodonticum. And we can see 5.8% of the 9.4% is coming from just those two uh, Fusobacterium species. But then also we've got the poor, uh, and this is another hard one to say, so bear with me, Porphyromonas endodontalis and P. gingivalis, which contribute another 2.7%. So we can see that from these four bacterial species, 8.5% of the 9.4% uh, for halitosis related bacteria are just coming from four species. So if I can get rid of these Fusobacterium and these uh, uh, Porphyromonas, wow, it's such a hard one to say, I may improve my salivary microbiome. At least that's part of the goal. And we can see that story uh, similarly in levels of gum inflammation related bacteria as shown here. So for the first two tests, they were relatively lower, 3.8%, 1.8%, but then they went up to 4.9%. So this is also going in the wrong direction. And once again, we can see levels of Fusobacterium and Porphyromonas popping up, uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum, uh, Porphyromonas endodontalis and gingivalis contributing all of the 4.9% just from these three bacterial species. So with that in mind, for the next test, the primary goal is to reduce levels of bacteria that are coming from these bacterial genera, Fuso Fusobacterium and por uh, Porphyromonas. So how can I do that? So berberine, this is where the story comes in for berberine. Berberine may be a promising approach. Now note that there are no randomized control trials that have tested berberine as, uh, and its potential impact on the salivary microbiome. This is from an in vitro study uh, and, and uh, 
The reason for that is there are very few RCTs, unfortunately, in people who have uh, relatively healthy uh, salivary microbiomes. Most of them, if, if they do exist, you know, they're in people who have advanced gum disease or, or, or periodontitis. So uh, there's a paucity of data in this field. So I have to go to the in vitro data to see what may work in my case. So what we're looking at here is the relative abundance of bacteria in saliva. And in this case, the saliva was from 20 people, 10 men and 10 women that were in the 30 to 57 year old range. And then the controls had uh, P. gingivalis was added to the saliva. So they spiked saliva on the left with P. gingivalis. Now, this didn't, didn't just impact levels of P. gingivalis in the original saliva. It changed the composition of the whole salivary microbiome. So first, starting with uh, Porphyromonas in green, as shown there, we can see that relatively low levels in the original saliva went up a lot in the uh, controls that it was spiked with P. gingivalis. Now, this, this shouldn't be a surprise. If you add sugar to water, you're going to have a higher level of sugar in your samples. But what is, somewhat uns uh, what is somewhat surprising is that it changed the composition of the salivary microbiome. For example, when looking at Fusobacterium in yellow, which were relatively low in the original saliva, now we can see an expansion of Fusobacterium in the controls that were spiked with P. gingivalis, which is not Fusobacterium. They didn't spike it with Fusobacterium. But then also note that Streptococcus, which I introduced earlier, which were about 20% in these uh, controls or in the original saliva, we can see that they were reduced by about half in samples that were spiked, saliva samples that were spiked with P. gingivalis. So uh, in terms of changing the composition of the salivary microbiome, we can see that spiking the saliva with P. gingivalis didn't just increase its parent genera, Porphyromonas, but it also increased Fusobacterium while decreasing Streptococcus. So what does this have to do with berberine? How does berberine or does berberine impact levels of these, of these three bacterial genera? And that's what we can see here. So BC stands for berberine chloride. And the last three columns, the 15, 30, and 60, are low, medium, and high concentrations of adding berberine to the P. gingivalis spike saliva. And, and first, we can see that it had a big impact on reducing levels of porphyromonas. As you can see, the green now has gone back down to where it was in the original saliva. But yet, these were samples that were spiked with P. gingivalis. But in the presence of berberine, uh, P. gingivalis clearly isn't able to grow. Now, a second change is on Fusobacterium in the presence of berberine. Although in the lowest concentration of berberine at 15 micrograms per mil, you can see that their yellow is still relatively high compared to the controls. At the highest content of adding berberine to the P. gingivalis spike saliva, we can see that on the right, it's almost completely absent. So adding berberine also almost completely eliminated uh, levels of Fusobacterium, which is also good news. And then the last bit of good news is that we can see an expansion of the Streptococcus, such that the highest uh, co uh, level of berberine, BC, that was added to the P. gingivalis spike saliva, we can see that that Streptococcus, the blue bar, went up a, a lot, even higher than where it was when it first started in the original saliva. So note that each of these bacterial genera can be improved in my salivary microbiome. So before concluding that this is the uh, best of news, these are the uh, genus level data. We need to know if the species uh, that berberine can impact uh, overlap with my bacterial species. And then if they do, that may indicate a potential positive role for berberine on my salivary microbiome. So within which species with, within each of these bacterial genera were impacted by berberine? And that's what we can see here. So first, we're starting with Porphyromonas gingivalis, and then each of the two Fusobacterium, nucleatum, spe uh, Fusobacterium species, Nucleatum and Periodonticum. So just going through this data, and it's going to be a similar story to what I just showed uh, on the previous slide. Starting with saliva that did not, did not have P. gingivalis in it, and when comparing it with the controls, which did, we can see that there was that big expansion of each of these bacterial species when compared with the original saliva that was not spiked with P. gingivalis. So what was the impact of adding berberine? And then we can see the three different con uh, concentrations, 15, 30, and 60 micrograms per mil. And when looking at the highest dose of berberine, we can see that levels of these three bacteria, even though they were added to saliva samples that were spiked with P. gingivalis, the, the sum, 1.7%, so you can see 1.2, 0.5, the sum of these three bacteria is now 1.7% in the highest dose of berberine, which is almost identical to the amounts that were just in saliva 
But note that these samples were spiked with P. gingivalis. So this is good news. It seems that it seems that berberine can reduce levels of these three bacterium, especially these bacterium are relatively high in my salivary microbiome. So what was the impact of berberine on Streptococcus species? And here are four that were pr presented in this paper that have direct relevance to me as I ha also have data on them. So first, just looking at the sum of these four uh, Streptococcus species in the untreated saliva, it was 17.5%. When spiking the uh, saliva samples with P. gingivalis, it went down to 6.6%. And then after adding berberine, it started to go back up as the berberine content uh, of saliva increased, such that the highest dose of berberine increased streptococcus levels to even higher than with it, where they were in the untreated saliva of 17.5% versus 31.8%. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my streptococcus levels have room for improvement too. And here are levels of my streptococcus, the same four streptococcus species, for the first three tests. So for my data, I've been in the 12 to 16% range in terms of the relative abundance of all the microbes in my saliva. Now, more specifically, I have room for improvement with Streptococcus salivarius as shown there in the study and then also in mine. So I should note that I can't have zero, even though it says zero for test number one, because in order for that to become 0.2% of all my microbes in test number two, there has to be a non-zero level where it can grow enough to 0.2. If it was truly zero, I would have zeros across the board. It wouldn't be able to grow at all because this isn't something you're just you know, going to get from food or in the air. So for test number four, when considering ber berberine's positive effects on uh, quote-unquote bad bacteria in my sample, the Porphyromonas and Fusobacterium, but then also potentially beneficial bacteria, I'm going to add berberine cl uh, chloride, and I should say I've already added it. I've had it in my mouthwash for about a week now. And I've added it a little bit higher than what was in this study, um, about 100 milligrams per liter, which is also equal to 100 micrograms per milliliter. And that's my, my scale. The limit of detection on my scale is 0.1, mil, uh, 0.1 grams, which is 100 milligrams. So uh, I can't really go lower than that. So it's a little bit higher than the dose used in the in vitro study. I'm also going to remove potassium nitrate from the homemade mouthwash, as we see. As we saw, it didn't increase, it didn't further increase nitrate uh, reducing bacteria in my sample. I'm going to also take out clove oil because that clearly didn't improve my salivary microbiome. And then last but not least, I've started supplementation with Streptococcus salivarius as an oral prebiotic, and I started that two days ago. Uh, so I don't plan on taking that for long. I just want to seed it enough so that if berberine can affect uh, affect positively affect my salivary microbiome, it's there, thereby enabling it to grow a lot further, a lot higher than where it was at 0.2%. So then will it work? That's the big question. And uh, stay tuned for that in a future video. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of those discount links that I mentioned and merch. So first, discount links for oral microbiome composition, as I mentioned with bristle, uh, epigenetic testing, at-home blood testing, diet tracking, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in that, that link will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.